Take your Bibles and open with me to Second or First Kings chapter uh, 17. First Kings and uh, chapter 17. Uh, we are introduced to Elijah in First Kings 17 and verse 1. Uh, the way we are introduced to Elijah should really encourage our hearts because Elijah comes as a light that shines in a dark place, a place filled with immorality, a place unabated with idolatry, a place that uh, was led by immature men, a place where men had been harsh, cruel, and ruthless. And Elijah comes in this place and I think instills in us a sense of hope. Uh, he was God's man delivering God's message to the wicked King Ahab. And following his message, so that was all in verse 1, and following his message, the King Ahab, uh, to King Ahab, we focused on the Lord basically leading Elijah in an unexpected direction. The Lord told Elijah to go by the brook Cherith. Uh, and we mentioned that it is important for us to know how the Lord leads, and we noted a, a number of truths as to how God leads. And, and let me just give you a brief summary. Uh, first of all, God's leading was preceded by the obedience of Elijah. We also noted that God's leading was limited to the next immediate step. God didn't unfold everything to Elijah. He says, you're going to go up on Mount Carmel, and you're going to call down fire. None of that. Just the next step is go to Cherith. And that's, by the way, how God leads us. The next step, one step at a time. We also noted that God's leading took Elijah in an unexpected direction. We might have thought that um, after he announced to Ahab that judgment is coming, that he would have gone on a preaching tour throughout Israel and told everybody, judgment is coming, the drought is coming, repent uh, at the judgment of God. Uh, but God led him to be secluded, to be away from everyone. We also noted that God's leading was purposeful. Uh, Elijah was not wasting time while he was there. There was a specific reason why God wanted him there, and we're going to talk about some of those this evening. We also noted that God's leading was uh, preparatory in the sense that God was preparing Elijah uh, for the next thing. We also noted that, finally, that God's leading was the place of provision, that the but it was only by the brook Cherith that the Lord was going to feed Elijah and nowhere else. God said, I'm going to feed you there where I've told you to go. Now, we see these truths not only in the life of Elijah as to how God leads, but also throughout the scriptures we see a pattern throughout the biblical record. Before we make any claim that God is leading us, we should be willing to examine the bold claim that we're making. Uh, as we continue in the same text here, 1 Kings chapter 7, I would like for us to consider another aspect of Elijah's time by the brook Cherith. And so in this study, I would like to uh, put into perspective Elijah's, uh, might we call it his season at Cherith. So let's read our text, 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 2. All right, now, children, if you have your Bibles, are you right there? 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2. All right, follow along. We're going to read right there. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. I would like to bring your attention back to verse 5. We notice the decision of Elijah. The Bible says, For he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith. Now, 
Notice he went and dwelt by the brook. The word that I'm interested in this evening is the word dwelt. Uh, the word means to remain, to settle, to abide, to continue. Uh, this word was also used at that time in reference to a marriage relationship. It could mean to marry someone, to dwell with someone. And so Elijah remained, remained by the brook Cherith. He settled there. He abided there. He continued there. And for an extended period of time, we might say that Elijah was married to the brook Cherith for a season of his life. Now, what would his time by the brook Cherith accomplish? Again, I mentioned last week that this was God's leading, and where God leads, God is not wasting time. So, what would his time by Brook Cherith accomplish? I would like to preach a message that I've entitled, Dwelling by the Brook Cherith. Dwelling by the Brook Cherith was this. It was a season in the life of Elijah. And what I mean by season is that when he went to King Ahab, he did not come from the Brook Cherith. He would also not remain by the brook Cherith for the rest of his life. Uh, Cherith was a season of his life. If we consider the span of our lives, I think we all come to understand that our life is made up of seasons. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I had a season as a child a long, long time ago. That season, by the way, was temporary. I had a season as a, I might call it a young man. That was a temporary season. I had a season for four years as a college student. That was a temporary season. I had a season while I was in college as an employee uh, working at Dealer's Warehouse. That was four years. That was temporary. Uh, I had a season also as a single man. Praise the Lord. That was temporary. <laughs> I have a season now, and I'm currently in this season. I'm in a season as a married man. I'm also in a season as a father. That's a season of my life. For a while, for six years at Capital Baptist Church, I was an assistant to the pastor. That was a temporary season. I am now in a season of my life where I'm a pastor, and that is the current season of my life. As we examine our lives, we look at our lives as seasons. We're not always in the same season. Elijah's season by the brook Cherith was not wasted time. So the question then is, what was the Lord teaching Elijah during this season of his life? I have one simple question for us. What has the Lord been teaching you? What has the Lord been teaching me? in the season of the life that you are currently in. Now think about that question. What has God been teaching you in the current season of your life that you are in? And so I'd like to deal with that to see what Elijah would learn during this season of his life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your word. I pray that you'd help us to learn uh, some things about Elijah and his season at Cherith that might be a benefit to us as we Consider the season of life, that the seasons we've been in and the season we are currently in. Lord, help us to see that our life is not to be wasted, uh, but there is to be a profit to our time and to the seasons of our lives. So help this message to come with, uh, through with clarity. Instruct us by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what lessons are learned in Elijah's season at Cherith? Now, let me just establish, first of all, as a reminder from last week, that Cherith was the place of God's leading, correct? Uh, Cherith was the place of God's provision, right? That is the place that God says, I will send the ravens and they will bring flesh unto you. And yes, Cherith was the place of God's preparation. And these truths sound really wonderful, do they not? Oh, God's uh, chosen this place for you. God's 
going to provide for you in this place and God's preparing you in this place. And so all, all of that sounds really wonderful. And no one was going to deny, is going to deny that God chose Cherith for Elijah. Uh, no one would deny that God provided for the needs of Elijah at the brook Cherith. And so all of this sounds wonderful, yet there is another reality for Elijah about this specific season. And I think we could rejoice in saying that God led Elijah, but I want us to think about the other aspect, and that is to put ourselves in the shoes of Elijah and to be in the place where God has led you, and now you're in the season of life, what are you going to learn while you're in that season? And we can make three definite remarks about this season that maybe make it sound not so good as initially the place of God's provision and God's leading and God's preparation. That's all positive. But are you aware that based on the text that Cherith, is we might call it, it is a season of solitude. That doesn't sound as positive as God's choosing and God's preparation, God's provision. You see, the solitude of this season is something for us to consider. Elijah will be spending this season of his life by the brook Cherith by himself. Unless, of course, you count the ravens. <laughs> However, I don't think that they provided any meaningful fellowship for Elijah. So we see the solitude of this season. We also note in the text the extensiveness of this season. Now that's not as pleasant as, you, as we think about it. Uh, verse 7 just told us, and it came to pass after a while. <laughs> so Elijah was there for a very long time. Um, and so Cherith was a prolonged stay or uh, we might call it a prolonged season. So it is, the we see the solitude of the season, the extensiveness of the season, but we also see the difficulties of the season. The difficulties of the season are made evident by the reality that we know of Elijah's humanity. In the first message that when we introduced Elijah, we made note of what is said about Elijah in James chapter 5 and verse 17. And the Bible says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. In other words, Elijah was a man just like you and I. Uh, the expression here, like passions, means that he was similarly affected by things that we are affected. That he had the uh, same human constitution that we do. Uh, that he was liable to the same sinful propensities as we are. Uh, he needed the same type of support as we do. And so Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. And so when we think about Cherith, although we might think positively, yes, that's the place of God's choosing, it's the place of God's preparation. It's the place of God's provision. That's wonderful. But it is also for Elijah a place of solitude, a place that is extensive, and a place that is difficult. And we have to realize those things. And so with those things in mind, as we consider Elijah's season at Cherith, I wrote down some things. Well, not wrote, typed out some things that Elijah learned at Cherith. And I want us to think about the seasons of life that we are all in. And you could probably look back at your life and say, well, I remember my season when I was single. I remember the season of, for some of you, when I had children in the home. You're not in that season anymore. And so there's different seasons of your life. Uh, but I believe that God wants to meet us at every season of our lives. And that God wants to teach us some things about those seasons. So here's what we learn about Elijah's season at Cherith. First of all, at Cherith, Elijah will learn the joy of knowing and doing the will of God. Now I want you to think about that for just a moment. Notice with me verse 2, because in our text, we find that it was the Lord who came to Elijah. The Bible says in verse 2, And the word of the Lord came unto him. That's Elijah saying. Uh, you see, it is one thing for us to know God. 
It is another thing for us to know and to do God's will in our lives. Uh, what, would, what would give Elijah, let me ask you this, during a time of solitude, uh, an extended time there, and the difficulties of uh, Cherith, what would give Elijah any peace during that season of his life? experiencing an extended period of solitude and wrestling with his flesh, I think we might, if we're honest, might prove to be difficult. Uh, so what did Elijah have to hold on to during this season of his life? Simply this, knowing that he was doing the will of God. Because it was God that told him to go there. You see, the season of Elijah at Cherith would have been completely different had it been Elijah's decision to go there. Had Elijah decided to dwell by the brook Cherith without consulting the Lord, his experience would have been completely different. Again, think about his solitude, the length and the extent of his solitude, and the difficulties that he dealt with at Cherith. And so it is important for us to learn this valuable lesson. Knowing and doing the will of God is sure to keep us at peace in the difficult seasons of our life. Knowing and doing the will of God is sure to keep us at peace in the difficult season of our life. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. You see, Elijah, if I was to come here, and I, let's pretend I don't know Elijah, and I don't know the account, and I, I just happen to walk by the brook Cherith, and I see Elijah, I might say, Elijah, what are you doing here? Don't you want to go home? Uh, don't you want to, like, make something of yourself? Shouldn't you be preaching throughout the nation in the middle of this drought? Elijah's reply would have been something like this. God brought me here, and I'm doing His will. You see, because if everything else would bother him, the comments of those who are the onlookers who don't know that God has brought him there would say, well, this is peculiar. So what is it that would keep Elijah there? You see, at Cherith, Elijah learned... The joy of knowing and doing the will of God. There's a second thing we find at Cherith. At Cherith, Elijah will find that personal obedience to God is better than public fame. Now, I want you to think about what just happened before he goes to Cherith. Elijah had finished delivering the message to King Ahab. The, this confrontation would immediately give Elijah fame. We already noted, by the way, the extent of his fame by King Ahab's attempt to look for Elijah. If you go to chapter 18 in verse 10, when he uh, speaks to, uh, if you notice, to Obadiah, here's what Obadiah says to Elijah in verse 10. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord, that's Ahab, hath not sent to seek thee. <laughs> and when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation and that they found thee not. So in other words, what I'm saying to you is Elijah was the most famous man in Israel and he didn't know it. You see, the Lord told Elijah, remember, go hide yourself by the brook Cherith. After he gave the word and delivered the word to King Ahab, he goes and hide himself, and yet there's the buzz all around him. Notice verse 3 of 1 Kings 17. Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. You see, Elijah would become the most wanted man in the entire kingdom of Israel. Now remember what Elijah had told the king. Why was he the most wanted man? Remember what he told the king in verse 1? There shall be no dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So when there's no rain and no dew and nothing, who are you looking for? The man who says at his word, the rain would fall. And so while Elijah remained at Cherith, 
he would be unaware that the entire kingdom was looking for him to bring back the rain. Can you see the, let's think about, Elijah is by the brook Cherith, he's by himself, and let's go over now and step away from Elijah and go into the kingdom of Israel. Can you see the turmoil going on in the kingdom? Can you hear the name of Elijah spoken throughout the kingdom? Can you hear all the crying that the people would come and they would come to the king? Can you hear Ahab after hearing the complaining of the people about the drought, commanding the prophets of Baal to send rain? Remember, because Baal was the God of prosperity and he's the one that sent the rain. And so Ahab is, there's, there's chaos in the kingdom. The prophets of Baal are in chaos. Can you feel even the frustration of Jezebel uh, with the inability of her prophets to produce rain? I mean, she's the one that brought Baal into the picture. And so while all of this turmoil is going on in the kingdom, Elijah is by the brook Cherith in solitude and silence. There's like a great contrast for us there. Chaos in the kingdom, peace by Brook Cherith. The entire kingdom was in turmoil and clamoring. Elijah was at peace. While Ahab was, think about it, dependent on the word of Elijah, Elijah was obedient to the word of the Lord. Can you hear the entire kingdom shouting, we need Elijah. We need Elijah. Where is Elijah? And then you go by the brook and here's Elijah. And Elijah says, this is the place of God's choosing. We must understand that the, great, the greatness of Elijah, the greatness of Elijah, please understand this. I know we, and I know the children hear the stories and we give them in Sunday school. But the greatness of Elijah was not in his withholding of the rain. Nor is the greatness of Elijah discovered in his calling fire down from heaven. Nor is the greatness of Elijah found in his translation. That is not what made Elijah great. The greatness of Elijah was found in his personal obedience to God. The rain, the fire, and the translation were all acts of God. Elijah had no power. The one power that Elijah did have was the power to obey God. You see, at Cherith, Elijah found that personal obedience to God was better than public fame. Number three, at Cherith, Elijah will learn that dependence on the Lord must be absolute. Now, remember, in verse 4, the Lord told Elijah what he would do for him by the brook Cherith. Notice verse 4. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee. And what's the last word? There. So Elijah must go to a place where he can learn absolute dependence on the Lord. Now, I am certain, based on where Elijah came from, that Elijah had learned as a young man how to gather food for himself. I'm pretty convinced of that. Whether it was farming or hunting, he had in the past used his own strength and no doubt developed certain skills. However, by the brook Cherith, Elijah used none of these things. It is not wrong, by the way, to learn, to work, to learn skills. And I would say that these are valuable and necessary. But it is wrong if by our work and our skills we think we do not need the Lord. That we are completely self-sufficient, dependent on no one but ourselves. Isn't it interesting here at this moment that God is going, He's trying to tell Elijah something. I'm going to bring you by a brook. You're going to drink there. And then I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. You're not going to be hunting, Elijah. You're not going to be farming. I will bring the food to you. 
What is God trying to teach Elijah in this moment? Elijah is learning that dependence on the Lord must be absolute. By the way, do you think that would prepare him for Mount Carmel? Well, absolutely. By the way, this is again is a pattern through scriptures. All of those principles we find here in the text are found throughout the scriptures. Jesus taught his disciples in John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do, what's the last word? Nothing. Does that communicate absolute dependence? Absolutely. Uh, that was, by the way, that was Jesus teaching his disciples before his betrayal and crucifixion. Right before that time. But you know one of the first principles he gave them in Matthew chapter 4 verse 19 is this. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Note the guarantee of Jesus. I will make you. Let these words ring in our hearts and our minds. Jesus will make us. That is learning absolute dependence. You see, Elijah, what, what, what is all Cherith all about? Well, I think we have to say, based upon what the Lord said, that there I'm going to feed you. That dependence on the Lord, he's going to learn that dependence on the Lord must be absolute. There's a fourth thing we learn. At Cherith, Elijah will further nurture his communion with the Lord. Now, I, I think that's self-evident, although it's not explicitly stated in the text. I want you to notice verse 5. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went, that's Elijah, he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Now, the word dwelt means to remain, to settle, to abide, to continue as we talked about, to be married to. And so Elijah remained by the brook Cherith. He settled there. He abided there. He did not leave brook Cherith. He continued there for an extended period of time. And so we might say that Elijah here, we understand, did not go back and forth and visit his family and friends is what I'm trying to, to communicate to us. He, he was not, well, you know what? Whenever you get lonely, Elijah, you can go home for a little while and then come back. No, he dwelt there. He made that place his abode. He was married to that place for a season of his life. Elijah did not go back to his family, did not go back to his friend. He was there alone with no one to speak to. Wait a minute. But God is there with him, isn't he? Isn't it interesting here that... Although we say he's a man of God, no doubt he's a man of God, proclaiming the message of God. But I do think at Cherith, with no other people around, that Elijah at Cherith will further nurture his communion with the Lord. Would you turn with me to Psalm 139? Psalm 139. I, uh, I, I realize that it doesn't take for us to be in a secluded place to feel lonely. I think that there's a lot of people who are very lonely in the world who are around us, around many people. But Psalm 139, notice beginning in verse 1, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. By the way, is there any indication that anybody knew where Elijah was? No. Nope. No indication. No, everybody was looking for him. Even his fellow prophets were looking for him. They could not find him. But the Lord knew exactly where Elijah was. Verse 2. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 
If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, the darkness of, uh, and the light are both alike to thee, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's wombs, womb, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned as when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! The point I'm making is the psalmist was aware that in his time of loneliness, the Lord was with him, that there was nowhere he could go where the Lord wasn't. You see, I believe that God in part brought Elijah to Cherith so that he might further nurture his communion with the Lord. He already is in fellowship with the Lord because he's hearing the Word is speaking to him. And he is the Lord's mouthpiece. We already saw that. But I don't think if you'd ask Elijah, if you'd ask him, hey, have you arrived in your, at a place of perfect communion with God? I think I know what the answer of Elijah would have been. What the answer is of every man. Should be of every man. I have not arrived. And so this is a place of solitude for an extended period of time and difficult. I can guarantee you he's not talking to the ravens. He's going to speak to the Lord. You see, human interactions today can consume our time. We now live, furthermore, in a social media environment, news everywhere at your fingertips. And whenever we go on to, uh, we can go on in a second and be consumed all day from, from, from dawn to dusk with people's voices all around us. It is spiritually healthy for us every once in a while to shut off all voices in order to nurture communion with the Lord. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we fill our ears, our eyes, our hearts, and our minds with the voices of everyone except the Lord. Or except three times, three hours a week when we go to church. That is not a way to nurture communion with the Lord. And so at Cherith, Elijah uh, further nurtured his communion with the Lord. But there's something else we find in the text. We see that at Cherith, Elijah will develop a contentment in the limited provision of the Lord. Notice verse 6. Really, the next piece of information we find in our text is the details of God's provision for Elijah. Here's what he's going to entail. You ready? You ready for this buffet? I'm, I'm joking here. Verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So water, flesh, and bread every day. That's it. Bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. Now look, wasn't Elijah subject to light passions as we are? Let's see here. Is there any example in the Bible of human nature that reacts negatively to the same food day after day after day after day? Oh, all through Exodus and Numbers. I mean, there it is. So we know th this Elijah being a man subject to like passion as we are. Do you not think that he would tire of the same food day after day after day? And so what is God trying to do? He's trying to develop a contentment in the limited provision of God. You see, um, someone might say, well, God, I mean, isn't he your like, choicest servant? Isn't he light in a dark place? So, Lord God, where's the milk and the honey and the garlic? What will Elijah learn in this season? He will learn to simply be content with God's provision. You see, a sure way to miss what the Lord has for us in whatever season of life we are in is a spirit of discontentment. 
If you grow discontent with whatever season of life you are in, you are sure to miss what God has for you. Why? Because what occupies your mind is not what God has provided during this season of your life. Your mind is preoccupied with what you don't have. And it's not a spirit that is going to promote spiritual development in our lives. There's one last thing we see at Cherith. So at Cherith, Elijah developed a contentment in the limited provision of the Lord. But number six, at Cherith, Elijah will understand the will of God is not free from difficulties. Do you notice with me verse 7? There's an additional detail provided, I think, for our benefit. Notice 1 Kings 17, 7. And it came to pass after a while. Say, well, how long was that? I don't know. It was a while. That the brook dried up. Because there had been no rain in the land. <laughs> now, by the way, isn't this the man who at his word can say rain? <laughs> Isn't that what he told Ahab? But the brook is drying up. You know, I wonder if maybe he thought to himself, you know, I could call the rain now to come. As he sees the brook day after day after day getting lower and lower and lower, the brook dried up. Elijah's time by the brook, here's what it tells us, was not free from difficulties. That season of his life was not free from difficulties. Think about it. As the days passed, Elijah would slowly see the brook getting lower and lower. The sight of the brook slowly drying up, I think, would prompt some natural thoughts in Elijah. I mean, we, we did the men's camp out just a few weeks ago. And uh, we were close to running out of water bottles. Well... We went to the store, got water bottles. <laughs> Why? Because it was hot and humid. So, and we thought the supply is getting low. We need to replenish it. Because if we are in this heat without water, it's going to be a problem. Think about Elijah in this moment. I would imagine he would ask himself, how many days do I have until there's no more water? How many days can I live without water? Should I store up water while it's still coming? Should I leave? How long should I wait? Do you not think that those things went through the mind of Elijah as the brook is slowly drying up? I mean, we might say the doubts would be natural for Elijah to have. Elijah would understand, however, that obedience to the will of God does not mean freedom from difficulties and challenges. Now God's going to take him from that place and lead him to another place and provide for him. But is it interesting that God in the next step is going to come to Elijah with the next step of his life, the next step of his ministry, but God doesn't do so until the brook is dried up? Almost as if God is trying to find out if Elijah is going to leave. What is he going to do with this? You see, we must understand that the will of God is not free from difficulty. So here is what Elijah learned at Cherith. He learned the joy of knowing and doing the will of God. He found that personal obedience to God was better than public fame. He learned that dependence on the Lord must be absolute. He further nurtured his communion with the Lord. He developed a contentment in the limited provision of the Lord. And he understood that the will of God is not free from difficulties. Whatever season of life we are in, Here's the truth that I can tell you about God. Although I cannot say that these exact things are what God's trying to do in your life. I can say this with, for certainty. God's trying to teach you some things. In whatever season of life you are in. And so we have to be aware of that and say, Lord, what do you have for me in this season of my life?
whatever comes is designed undoubtedly to bring you closer to the Lord and to make you more like Jesus Christ.